So welcome everyone to the 59th hands on Agile meetup. Uh, today uh, we are hosting Joanna Rothman for the second time. I'm totally thrilled because she has an excellent topic that everyone of us is uh, daily uh, experiencing. Um, Agile not working for you. So how, what can you do about it? You know, so you poured in a lot of effort into making this work probably, and it's simply not, not, uh, not getting any traction in your organization. What might be the reason for that? And more importantly, what can you do about it? Um, Joanna, I'm, we'll switch to speak of you now and, um, stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. If, um, for those of you who are wondering, I have two monitors, so I will I will look at you and my slides, and every so often I will look at you and to see your smiling faces. So if you see me um, shake my head back and forth, it's because I'm looking. All right, so let's talk about this business, um, agility and agile, because every time um, I I work with clients, they all tell me we're, we've gone agile. We've, we've done it. We are all set with our Agile, except. And when they say except, they often say, well, we have these really long backlogs and our roadmaps go for 18 and 24 months at a time. And the teams tell me they became feature factories where the product owner, um, well, the ostensible product owner says, just give me this one or two or three or 45 more features, but there's no product strategy to discuss with that. Um, many of the team members say, we don't get to experiment. We're, we're supposed to deliver something. We need, we have alternatives. We may take path one or path two or path three or even path 45, but we are not allowed to experiment. And then because there's no experimentation, there's a lot of late changes in the product development. And what, what the teams tell me is that they have no joy and no ease and work is a real grind. And what the managers tell me is we spent so much money on, on all of this agile training and none of it is working. We want our own agile approach and that agile, that agile approach, their own agile approach looks a lot like waterfall. So if I if I have to assign a root cause, there are many, many causes, but there's at least one root cause, and that is the culture of the organization. So many people tell me agile, agile is a mindset or set of practices. It's not, it's actually a form of culture. And the, the issue we have is that our organizations are built around resource efficiency, where the work assignment comes in, one person takes it, they do their part, they finish it, they hand it off to another person, that second person, then they hand it off to the third person, et cetera, et cetera. And so every single time there's a handoff, there's a delay. And that means everything takes longer than any any one person who estimated their work could imagine. And that focus on the individual is, is all this um, really gets in the way of creating an agile culture. Instead, we need, to, we need to use slow efficiency thinking where the team collaborates as a unit. Now, if you have a large team, maybe you collaborate as subunits. You know, it does not have to be all of the people all on one item. But when when we use resource efficiency thinking and there are seven people on the team, there's often seven open stories. When we use flow efficiency thinking and there are seven people on the team, we might only have one or two, maybe three open stories. And one of the reasons why resource efficiency that kind of a culture is so pervasive is because it's all about the organizational rewards. So we are not going to fix that in this talk, right? You have the, you have 
little to no ability to fix the organizational culture. However, you can choose many actions that will make it better for you. And that's the point. But you need to see your reality and then say, what could I do to make us use more flow efficiency thinking and actions and fewer resource efficiency thinking and actions? So, right. yeah, all right, let me go on. So instead of the question of, should we use waterfall or agile? Which I don't see how that is a useful question. Almost all of us need some agility. So I would, I much prefer to ask this question. How can we manage our risks and incorporate agility into whatever we do? Right? That's the question that makes a lot of sense to me. And I hope it makes a lot of sense to you. So the first part is how do we clarify the risks that we have? Now, let me talk about the three major kinds of risks for what I'm calling feedback loop duration. The first is project risks. How, how will we make trade-off decisions in our project? And then what are the product risks? How, how risky is this product to implement? And what are the, what are the portfolio and organization risks? Right. Those drive how frequently we need to make decisions in both the product and the project. Um, and that's when we, when we think about risks, this is how we really decide the duration of the feedback loops that we need. So we, we can choose whether or not we want to decide faster, right? That's really, that's really the issue. Um, Stefan and I are both consultants and book writers and workshop deliverers and all that, all that good stuff. Um, Seven and I have a lot of common in our personal businesses. I suspect, and I have not asked Stefan this question, but I suspect that our feedback loops are often a day or less. When, when someone says to us or calls us or emails or something and says, we, we got this problem. Would you like to discuss our issues? We often say yes, right? We want the business. We want, we are in the business of supporting organizations as they evolve and change. So we, we need very short uh, duration feedback loops. Most of you in organizations often need maybe not daily short feedback loops, but often much shorter feedback loops than you have right now. So let me talk about the project risk. And if you've read any of my project management books, you will say, oh, these seem very, very familiar. I use a project pyramid to describe the project risk to my clients and, well, to everybody. Uh, you can have only one of these drive the project, right? One aspect of either feature set, time to release, load defects, cost to release, who the people are in their capabilities or their work environment. One of them drives the project. Now you have constraints, which might be a couple of the others. And I often see people who say, well, we really need this feature set. And then we really need it fast. And then we need it perfect. Right? So they're talking about the inside, everything that the team has control over. There are ways to manage those trade-offs, but you need to know which one is first. And in in this blog, I I can I can talk about this later in many posts in my blog. I talk about how you talk to people at the very beginning of the project, so you know how to make how to make choices for the project based on what is driving your project, what are constraints, and where do you have floats. Now. A lot of senior leaders say, well, we cannot afford to spend any more money on this project than X. In my experience, that's actually very, very malleable. No, so they might want to not spend any more money than X, but they often can if 
if the project is valuable, right? This is why it's all about the value of the work to the customer. Now, let me talk about product risks because they also affect life cycle choice. If you're doing a port of of your of your product from one hardware set to another hardware set, right? You can no longer buy those 15 year old chips or you want some other platform for your product. It's it's possible, although highly unlikely, that you have a relatively deterministic project, right? The product has no inherent risks. So you can say we don't have any necessary discovery. We all we need to do, all we need to do is use a serial approach. We can use a waterfall because we know the requirements. We know how we used to implement them and we can just follow along that linear path and have success. That's not been my experience, but I think it's possible, if, especially if you know exactly what you have to do and your project is very short, four weeks maximum, right? Maybe you can use a serial life cycle then. But most of us live in this messy middle where we have some amount of of iteration that we need and we don't always know, right? The most, most products are somewhere in this middle. We have a pretty good idea until we get to this point in our development, and then we have choices for where to go next. Very few, but a number of very high risk and high return pro, um, products require total agility. We need uh, the shorter, very short feedback loops because we might change the product strategy at any given moment, depending on, on what we discover. So most most products do not have a lot of recursive discovery and most products are in this messy middle. Messy middle requires iteration over feature sets and also requires incremental delivery. Yeah, however, not all of these require an agile approach. Now, the portfolio risks also can affect your life cycle choice. Um, and I, uh, I often ask this question, how often does your organization need to redesign on their project portfolio? And what I, I taught our project portfolio workshop to a small organization several years ago. And the, the, the senior leaders said, we need, we need to adjust a portfolio every single week, but the team could not deliver any, any given feature inside of a week mostly because senior leadership asked them to do this thing and then this thing and then this thing and then this thing. So it was a portfolio problem that exposed weaknesses in the team. And then because the team did not say no, um, then <laughs> yes, the team had, the team did not even understand. And yes, I will, I will be posting these slides on speaker net later. So the more portfolio risks, the shorter the feedback loops need to be. It's all about wh where do you have risks in the organization? How does that affect your choice of life cycle or agile approach? Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to choose a life cycle and show you a lot more pictures later. So I'm gonna briefly go through this. And agile is not a life cycle, right? And, and the agile approach is different. So the more the more project risks you have, um, the more you need an incremental or agile approach for date or low defects and more features, right? You can imagine that if you, especially if somebody says, "We want all of it by this date with really hot quality," um, that that requires more delivery and more agility than you might imagine. And then if you know what you need to do when it's a shorter time frame, yeah, maybe maybe a serial life cycle is fine. Um, I tend to use incremental life cycles 
much more often than anything else. Now, let me talk about an agile approach. I already said agility requires a thinking in flow efficiency. That's a culture change. With apologies to my colleagues and friends, it's not about a mindset. I I could let let me just be honest with you. I have a mindset to lose weight. I always have a mindset to lose weight. My mindset is not sufficient for losing weight. Um, I needed to change everything about how I worked out, what I ate. I needed to change my habits and focus on the outcomes that I wanted, not the practices I had used. So in the same way, agility is a cultural change. Now, let me talk about my general agile picture where we have ideas floating around in the organization. Somebody funnels those ideas into a ranked backlog. That responsible person is often called a product owner. I am now calling that person a product leader because it's not that the person owns the product, the person owns the leadership to keep the business value of the product going, right? That's, that's why I call it a product leader. Then all that ranked backlog goes into a cross-functional team who delivers increments of value. Now, I would love it if a team, if every agile team delivered increments of value every single day to their, to their customers. Not all customers want that. Not all teams can. So I, I differentiate between delivering internally. I believe every single, every single team can deliver internally every single day. And that's the first culture of change you might need for more agility in your team. How you deliver to your customers, that's a different problem. And all goes to the kind of product you have, the cost of, of releasing, all that other stuff. However, the more the more your team uh, delivers increments of value, the more often you can demo and then learn with a retrospective. So if you have an agile approach, you need a collaborative cross-functional team. That team limits the SWIP. This ranked backlog is not the entire, everything everybody has ever conceived of for this product. Not No, it's a few things for right now. That team releases often for feedback. They learn from what they did. This is why I really want people to start thinking in terms of agility and not agile. First, agile is um, Remember, it started off as an adjective. It was the agile manifesto for software development. Agile was an adjective in front of manifesto. Now, yes, I write a lot. I am a little bit of a grammar fanatic, a little bit of a word um, fanatic over here, but but an agile approach is not the same as agile with a capital A. I, I don't understand agile with a capital A. I understand agile approach. I understand agility. So I, I would like all of you to start thinking of agile approach and agility, building agility into whatever approach you take. So let me let me make sure agile teams deliver through the architecture, right? They t um, this is these are tiny stories that have some kind of value. And notice they, they go all the way from the GUI through the platform and um, back again, right? This is a round trip. If your team is not working through the architecture, but is working across the architecture, you are not using an agile approach because it's almost impossible to deliver something as often as you need to to be able to get the feedback on it, even if the feedback is just just inside your team, right? So agile teams deliver through the architecture. Now, if the more risk you have, the more you need to reduce the feedback loop duration. So I'm going to ask you to put a number in the chat. I will 
I will look at this while I take a uh, while I take a uh, um, my sip of water. Um, how is your in your assessment? When is what kind of collaboration do you have for for your agility? Um, there's um, one and two where people pretty much work alone. Um, um, there's four and five where pretty much people collaborate, and then there's three where we only really collaborate on urgent issues. Now I'm going to take a trick. Well, this is really good. I see, I see a few ones and twos, and and threes. Um, I see more. I see a lot of force. Well, some fours and fives. Yeah. So, um, and if this is your assessment, I'm not asking you to swear on a Bible or anything. No, no, no. This is all about how can you understand your team's general collaboration. Now, I find that agility only starts at about level three, right? Oh, only really starts because if you're collaborating on, um, on the urgent issues, you are much more likely to say, oh, if that works for the urgent issues, maybe we should do that more often, right? And that's, that's how, that's how I came to collaboration. I, look, I am an all programmer. I, I was, I was waiting in school on my ability to write code by myself, never in a team. And even my first couple of jobs at work, um, my first couple of jobs, that was all about working alone. It wasn't until my teams got to be closer to three or four or five people with multiple developers in the team that, I, oh, that my boss said, oh, are you working with anybody, Johanna? And I would say, no, maybe not. <laughs> and that's when I said, should I? And he said, yeah. Yeah, you really should. So that's when I really un I started to understand the value of collaboration and not just asking people to review my designs or review my code, but really pair write code, pair test. My first experience pairing was in 1982, and I I came into it kicking and screaming. I still don't think I had a really good um, arrangement with with my colleague, uh, but I, I understood that we, we developed a better product together than I had alone. That was good enough for me. So if you think about, um, if you think about how you can get from wherever you are to at least a three, where you start collaborating on the urgent issues and then say, how can we reduce how, um, how, how often we work alone and how, how can we increase how much we collaborate every day. So that was all about team collaboration. Let me talk about life cycles now. Now, all of you have heard about waterfall or stage gain or phases. It's all about, we do a lot of planning up front, right? Requirements, analysis, design. We finally get into code. We finally get into integration. <laughs> and then we test. And so this this is where people think it's a simple manner of programming or a simple manner of execution. Once you planned everything, uh, if you're interested in the book, I have all kinds of um, references to why this does not work. In fact, even Royce, the father of the so-called father of the waterfall um, life cycle, actually said on page, on the next page, after we had the pretty picture of the waterfall, he said, I don't recommend this. And so he had um, all kinds of what we would now think of as an agile approach with feedback loops everywhere. Lots and lots and lots of feedback loops. Um, Rice is my guy. Okay, so here's the reality for too many agile teams. And I, I'm calling them agile in, in quotes because in my experience, a lot of them get stuck in requirements hell. I found that a, a when when I was writing Manage It, Your Guide to Modern Pragmatic Project Management, um, I talked about requirements hell, where requirements 
we were still getting requirements before we finish integration. That's when I I I had said to um one of my well, let me back. Uh, so I was supposed to use a serial life cycle for one of the projects I was managing back in I don't know the eighties or something, and I um I didn't have any freezes. I I said all of these freezes are slush. You can call them anything you want, but there's a point in time when we said, yeah, we think it's a requirement freeze, but we had more we had more feedback loops, so I knew it wasn't really a requirements freeze. And then I said, um, we we will know what we ship when we get to the end of test and we cut a CD, or back in those days it was kind of tape, right? That's how we know what we will ship. And in the meantime, we are going to keep iterating over the requirements and we will keep iterating over what we think is done. So um, I had never seen, if you, if you keep asking people what they want, they will tell you, but if you don't deliver anything, they will tell you stuff that's wrong because when your product meets the customer, that's when the reality of the product sets in. That's when the customer says, oh, he gave me what I wanted, but it's not what I need, right? We we still get that in supposedly agile um, work. That's crazy. So the reality of too many waterfall life cycles is that there are feedback loops and there are unplanned feedback loops all the way through the project. Now, the iterative life cycles tried to fix that. Um, there's Barry Beam's spiral model, evolutionary prototyping, and um, safe, because there's all this elaboration and all that nonsense at the very beginning. So the more often you refine the prototype and obtain feedback, the better. However, if you don't deliver anything, you often find the project kiss of death. That's because you get feedback on a linear prototype. You have not you have not shipped anything to a uh, to a customer, so you cannot actually say, "Oh, we have this so far," right? And you could stop there. You cannot do that with an iterative life cycle. That's the problem with purely iterative iterative life cycles. That means that we need um, internal feedback much more often than external feedback. So if you want to make an iterative approach work, make sure you get feedback from outside the team. What does that mean? That means you release an increment of value. I know, you. where have you heard that before? Um, you don't have to release the entire product. So back in the 80s, I don't know, something like that, we were, I was working on, at Symbolics, and we were not, really not sure if our current operating system would meet the needs of our long-time users. So we were, um, we were working on new, the newest version of the operating system. And it was too early for beta, and it was, um, we, uh, we knew beta was not going to make it. And w that would be too late for all the feedback that we wanted. But we needed to do something. So we brought customers in. We made them sign an NDA, like an NDA effort doesn't any good. Yeah, we made them sign an NDA and they gave us really valuable feedback. So we had a lot of feedback early on and that allowed us to move into a more incremental life cycle at once, once we understood what the customers really wanted. We did not have the kiss of death, right? That, that's what I call lead feedback that requires us to return to the original requirements. So that's why I say this business of, of feedback is so, so important. Now, the incremental life cycles and the purely incremental life cycles, um, there are two kinds of them. There's design to schedule, which focuses on release candidates and you work by priority. And then there's stage delivery, which assumes the team will release. Now, you'll notice that both of these have 
some analysis to Tuesday architecture. Um, if you ever worked with me on an incremental life cycle, you got a week or two in order to refine the requirements, and then you got a week or two to choose the overall architecture because I knew, I knew, I knew from experience that as soon as we got past the first feature set, we would we would have to change something. We would. So why spend a lot of time on it if you're not if you know you're going to change it? However, having something to hang your features on might be really helpful, right? So the the interesting thing about about the incremental life cycles is it shows well the way I used to use them. It shows you a candidate architecture, and that I really like to to and then um, use it as a candidate, hang features off of it, and then up, update the paper pictures. I know. How how boring of me as opposed to documents. But the more the more we realize that the architecture and the UI and all of that is a candidate, the more likely we are to in to integrate changes as we go. And that's that's the point of the incremental life cycles. Now notice the incremental life cycles do not iterate specifically over a feature set. Back when I used them in the eighties and the nineties, we we said, oh, let's just do an entire feature set. Yeah. Um, this is this is the value of of an agile approach where we say we must iterate over the feature set while we deliver increments of value. So there might be late feedback in incremental life cycles um, because if we if we have not yet uh, if we have not yet released anything as in designed to schedule because it's only a release candidate. Do we actually revert to this release candidate? Do we do some more work here for them to make this release candidate? Oh, um, I, I rarely used, well, I, I, I cheat. I cheat in everything. I always mean my design to schedule incremental life cycles, stage delivery, because that worked. So, I, I really like stuff that works. Now, I talked a little bit before about combining approaches where I said, um, if you have, if you have a date driven project where you might need to iterate first over, over features and prototype what you know, then, and then you move to an incremental life cycle. So a lot of times I actually said, sure, um, let's do an initial pass at requirements. When I remember one product manager vividly in the 80s saying, you're only giving me a week for requirements? Sorry if I'm screaming at you. Um, I said, yes, you only have a week. You know the first three or four or five or six things that you need in this product. We don't need any more than that to prototype what we need for an architecture. We we don't need any more of that. And then we need to start into implementing and integrating, right? That's what we need to do because we don't have a lot of time to do this. And then if we have a feature driven um, product, then we can say, what kind of prototyping do we need first? And again, how little can we do at that prototyping? Um, that's where I often had a decision point. Do we need more prototyping? Do we start incrementing for releases? Do we now do a little increment increment of, of delivery, more, more prototyping? You can combine these in any way at all. But notice this. There's a decision point here as early in the product, uh, I should say in the project. So the more decision points you can have, the shorter the feedback loops can be, right? If, if you only have one decision point very late in the project. You might not even consider more feedback loops. Now, and if you have component teams, I don't I don't know how to make component teams really use an agile approach. I really don't. There are ways you can create more agility with um a, a check-in policy, which 
every every team integrates every single day and they resolve the issues as they as they integrate. I don't know of any other way. Oh, and frequent re releases. My most recent um let me take a, a sip. My most recent pragmatic manager newsletter had this business about component teams because I often see component teams very far away from each other in terms of time and space. So if if you have component teams all in in within four hours of overlap, you might be able to make this work. But what I too often see is the testers often in India and then there's the UI people somewhere and the other developers somewhere else. And then uh, the middleware people some, somewhere else. So this is a recipe for disaster. I, I do not know how to really make component teams use an effective agile approach. I, I'm not smart enough for that. So let me talk about agile approaches. These are not life cycles. I realize most of our leaders, our senior managers, were brought up in a time where every every kind of a project approach was a life cycle. But an agile approach is a cultural change. That's why it's not really a life cycle. So since it's, since it's a cultural change, fine, I will I will deal with it. I will call it almost anything the senior leaders want to call it. Um, Mostly, if I can get people to start thinking in shorter time frames, limiting width, and learning faster. Now, I used to think that um, an iteration-based approach was really the right way to start things because for years and years, I had used rolling wave planning with about a month-long iteration. Um, it was not really an iteration, but we we had deliverables that everyone would deliver across the project of the program for in inside a given month. You might think of it more as a release train now of not longer than a month. But we, I did not wait for anything for everything to be finished before we actually released, um, at least internally, in inside the organization. However, I now manage <laughs> my work. With the Kanban system, I use personal Kanban, where I limit my width and I right size my work. Now, right sizing work um, is useful for any agile approach, and the more you right size your work, the fast, the short, the the shorter your feedback loops can be. So, this is not you. You don't just right size your work in a Kanban system. You can right size your work anywhere. You don't just use time boxes. In an iteration-based approach, you can use 15-minute time boxes in a Kanban approach, right? There is no one right way. In fact, I strongly recommend you take from everything and use it because what really matters are the flow metrics. Oh, let me, before I go on to the flow metrics, let me talk, let me ask you to do this poll um, for your web limits to enable agility. Um, if you are at a one where you say where you're real, you're you're ready to start laughing at me because you can never say no to anything, or you take shortcuts shortcuts because you feel overloaded with width, um, that's a one and a two. Um, if you always love it with and you always finish what you start before taking on new work, um, and sometimes you you have to do production support. That's a four and a five, and then there are the um, there are the people who cannot get out of the interruption based approach. Okay, so I see a lot of I see a lot of threes, which is really really good. Um, I will I will suggest um, that if you start right sizing your work and really. Really look at your cycle time and say, on average, how many um, how many stories do we finish in a week? And then, if that number is um, one or fewer, really start to reduce the size of your stories 
and then uh, figure out what to do next. But the more the more you can manage your wit, the more likely you are to have um, more agility in your work. Because I find increasing agility makes it easier for everybody. This is not about agile is so great. No, it's not about that at all. Agility offers you shorter feedback loops. Those short feedback loops help manage the project and the project risk, not to mention the project portfolio risk. So it's all about managing the risk of finishing the work of, of satisfying customers, of making your work, your workplace and your team, um, a joyful and easier place to work, right? Not only about agile, but agility. So let me talk about the three team tips that you can consider. The first is focusing on the flow of the work. Now, if you have a manager, you know, any manager who says, I need to know what every single person on the team is doing so I can write that down every week and shove it in my folder so I can give them an individual performance review at the end of the year. I don't know what to tell you except look for a new job. Right? Just look for a new job. That manager is going to nickel and dime you forever. Okay, that's a different talk. Sorry. Um, Let me go on to your team can probably figure out a way to collaborate. And as long as your team can figure out that way, then maybe they can reduce our time box, all that upfront work. So they can reduce all those later unplanned feedback loops. And then keep a cross-functional team together that collaborates as um, for the entire project. Now, um, are there other things you can do? Absolutely. But I find if you think about this for the team, you are kind of halfway there. Now, always, always, always measure your flow metrics. Velocity has no meaning in any kind of an agile approach. Velocity is a, a single point measure of capacity. But cycle time tells you how long things really take. Aging tells you where the work is stuck and it goes to all the whip. Right, the whip is a work in progress. The throughput is how often the team can release something. Little saw is in violet, right? You cannot violate little saw. It will always show up, always, always, always. So that's why collaborating and limiting whip is such a, uh, a basic part of increasing agility. Now, for your culture and project tips, I really think that you can look at that the risk to say, how often do we need to release for feedback? Can we, can we use just internal releases? Do we also need external releases? Whether or not your, all of your customers can take your product, that's a different question. So if, if, you, if some of your customers can often take your product, great. And if, if none of them can, you, you need a way to get feedback. Because just because your, your customers are not sufficiently agile in, in their intake of the product does not mean you cannot learn from your work. I really like shorter projects to reduce unplanned feedback loops. The, f the first time I, I taught, um, oh, this is years and years ago, one of my clients was, um, Okay, a story from 20 years ago, a story from recently. I I have many clients over the same, um, at the same time because we work on different things. 20 years ago, I worked with them on reducing all of their upfront time for their, for their projects. It took them three months to start a project, right? They wanted to release in six months. So I worked with them on changing those three months to six weeks. Um, later on, they they asked me back again. They still said 
Well, we're down to four weeks at the beginning of the project for all this upfront work. Okay, fine, we need four weeks, but we're not releasing fast enough. Well, now we have five more months to figure out how to release something, but we only really release something a couple of months later. So I said, well, what have you done? They told me all kinds of things. I said, how about you decide that you only have three months, three month projects from now on? And everyone said, oh, Johanna, you're such a, a big blue meanie, right? Um, you're always challenging us to reduce the time that everything takes. I said, that's true. That's because your feedback loops are too long if, if you already reduce all that upfront time to one month and you cannot get anything out until the end of, of six months. There's some other feedback loop going on. What would it take for you to move to a three month delivery cadence? And then what would it take for you to move to a two month del delivery cadence? When you start reducing the size of your iterations, regardless of what those iterations are, um, that allows you to increase the agility in the work, right? Shorter projects will, will reduce unplanned feedback loops. And the more often you can deliver and demo, at least internally, the more likely you are to really figure out what's going on in your feedback loops. Um, I really like to say less planning and more delivery is a fun is how you get to real agility. So it's all all of our product development is about fulfilling your customers' needs. Agile is not the point. What do you need to do to satisfy the customer, to manage the risk to release, and to obtain revenue? Almost all of that is by earlier learning. The earlier you learn, the faster your feedback loops the more likely you are to actually fulfill customers' needs. Use your risk and figure out what your best approach is. And I don't care what you call it. <laughs> you can call it an agile iterative life cycle. And you can call it an agile incremental life cycle. You can call it JR's agile. You can call it Stefan's agile. I don't care what you call it. It's all about incorporating agility. And so... Your work is fun and easy. And I ho I really hope we can stay in touch. Yes, all of this is from the Project Life Cycles book. And I will um I will stop the share right now so I can see your smiling faces and look at the chat. All right, Stefan, you're gonna you're gonna facilitate questions. So we have a bunch, uh, there's a cluster of questions. It's all uh, dealing with the same issue. So how do you model risk and model value? And how do you measure risk and how do you measure value? Maybe that's a cluster you can answer in one go. So I often use the idea of cost of delay to manage, to understand value. Um, I find I use my picture of cost of delay. Let's see. I'm not sure if I can find it. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try and find it. I will put it with. Um, well, when you send me all the questions, I will probably do a blog post of all of the all of the questions and the answers that I that I answer and more. I will add a picture of cost of delay there. How about that? Um, I. I do not know how to measure ROI for a software product. That's because the product changes. I I mean, I've been looking at this for years and years. I think ROI, well, in, in Agile and Lean Program Management, I said, I can lie with ROI and you can too. So I don't measure ROI. I do look at cost and delay and I find that's really a focus for me of value. And that's how I use it. Now, I already, um, Stefan, I already forgot the rest of that question. Let's park those. And it's very kind of you that um, I'm, I'm allowed to send you the questions and you will have a look at them. This is awesome. 
So we have another question. No matter how we try. Oh, uh, for let me go back to the risk. Um, yeah, because asked um, there was how do you how do you model risk? I don't model risk in that sense. I try and say where where in the project pyramid do we have risk? What is driving our what is the one thing driving this project? What are our two um, constraints? And what do I need for degrees of freedom? And I find that's how I manage the risk. Um, I will add in, and I hope I remember this, um, the, a link to the questions I ask at the beginning of a project to assess the project risk. Now, for product risk, I really like to think about how, how much iteration do we need to understand the product that we want to sell and the customers we want to sell it to. And if you're not selling, if you're if your customers are down down the aisle from you, you you are still selling. You're just not making revenue on it. The organization has a different value for this, but it's still all about cost and delivery. Okay, sorry, no, Stephanie. No, 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 no worries. Uh, next one. No matter how we try to have teams work vertically, we get teams saying that they need a component team or a microservice team as they need to build things and uh, the others will build on top of them. What do you think? Is there a need for component or microservices teams? This is when you really need to think like the board. Assimilate those people into your team. If you reduce the whip in your... So one of the reasons we ended up with smaller teams is because everyone was focused on resource efficiency. Who was... Was was Joanna going to do the platform? Because she she has no UI understanding and no understanding that there are human beings on the outside on the other side of that of of her computer monitor. Yes, um, I am a platform person. I might I might make it into middleware. I am not a UI person. Don't ask me. I can break a UI with the best of them. I cannot design it. So I am. I am at the bottom of the, of the architecture, um, and I will never, ever be successful at being at the top of the, of the architecture. So, um, if you need, if you need more component, to, if you need more people, um, to fulfill all the necessary capabilities and, and skills, you assimilate them. This is why almost all new to agile approaches need a project manager, right? A Scrum Master has no title-based authority, but a project manager does. And a project manager, like me, can go in and can go into senior management and say, look, senior manager, I need these people. Otherwise, we cannot deliver what we need to deliver. And I don't need them for a day or a, or a week or two as visitor. No, because as soon as soon as I release them going off into into the ether, we're going to need them again. This is why measuring of that uh, the value stream, and I have an article called "Unearthing Your Project's Delays." Then I will also um, link to in this in this massive blog post or whenever that I choose to do later. I will I will show you that. Um, there is no listeners to a team does not increase agility. It just makes it much more difficult later. When, when you realize, oh, those people performed value for us, and now we need them again. Excellent. Next one. How to help the organization measure the benefits of agility? Oh, this is all about how fast you can release value, right? If you can increase revenue, increase customer acquisition, uh, decrease waste, all of that is, is what matters. If you if you start to look at the flow metrics for the organization, that's when agility will make more sense to you. But it, it's organization level; it's not team based level. I'm sure I have a, a blog post about that, and if not, I will break one. Oh, hey. yeah, I have the short and feedback loops. 
In some software development teams, it seems natural to have the design and mockups ready before development, before the sprint planning and QA done after, sometimes in the next sprint, and it seems to work for them better than doing all in the same sprint. That's more a kind of statement, um, but uh, any thoughts on that one? If those if those feedback loops are working for you, sure. We, maybe your feedback loops are as long as they need to be for your organization and your product. That's great. I I I would never separate um, coding and testing in iterations. That's because I, as a developer, I excelled at missing. Right, I wrote my tests for my code. And then I miss all the obvious defects every single time. And as a tester, I would find things that the developers say, nobody would ever do that. So I have seen this from both sides. And I find that integrating um, testing and, and coding is a necessary port, um, uh, part of software development. However, if shaping the work is something that makes more sense to you? Sure, do it. I think I think Basecamp does that. If it works for them, yeah. I think if if it works and you're happy with your feedback loops, do it. It's interesting how dogmatic some people are about it, right? Uh, always try to tell them we're, we're not getting paid for practicing Scrum, but for solving our customers' problems within the given constraints and contributing to the bottom line. This is it. Find your way. Right. Right. I I, I, I mean, maybe me, Stefan, maybe you, know, you have seen organizations where they can separate the coding and the testing. But if you have developers like me, you know, why do architecture and requirements work in dedicated time ranges ahead of increments? Does that hold for uh, other business analysis activities like risk analysis? So that's that's a really interesting question. The more this goes to the duration of the project and the complexity of the product, the the less complex the product, the more you can foresee. But the more complex the product, the less you can tell in advance, right? So, and that's why thinking about the product-based risks and how much determinism there is in the product, um, that will that will affect how much upfront work you can do and not have unplanned feedback loops, right? I, I mean, if you want unplanned feedback loops, you can try and define everything at the front. But so I, my product development is all about writing and speaking and all that stuff, right? I write books as part of my product development, which feels a lot like coding to me. Um, I've said that to some of the people here. It really, it feels like coding. Um, and I find that I always need to change the the user journey, which is, uh, which we understand, we understand user journeys from our, uh, from software product development. And I often have to re-architect the book several times to get the book in, in the right order, right? So I bring people on the user journey. Yeah, no, we, we've come to the end of our time box and I don't want to steal more of your time. You've been very, very gracious already. Um, but there are three small questions left. Would you be available? I for actually another? have time, so if oh, you have to put something, that's fine. I have the first of the three. Um, can you talk a bit about what you mean by right size to work and smaller chunks? Sure. So, though I um, I really like one day stories, right? I I work in one day stories. However, not all teams can do that because it's such a big change. From what they're doing now. So if your regular cycle time is about a week, right? Let, let's just um, say it's about a week. Um, that by and large, you you mostly manage to release a story once a week. Call it on Wednesday because I really like Wednesday. And um, sometimes your stories go until Friday, 
sometimes you finish them on Tuesday. Fine. It does not matter. But most of the time, you finish um, a story on, on Wednesday. In your next planning meeting, ask the team as a whole, does this look like the kind of size, right? Don't ask people to estimate in story points. Don't ask people to estimate in, in acorns or, or apples or anything. It said, based on what we normally release in a given week, does this look approximately like the same size? That's a way to write size. Um, Seth and I will, and will also link to one of my right sizing posts. Um, I find that mm-hmm. when when people start to measure this cycle time, and they say, "Oh, it takes us five days to release something," huh? I wonder if it would make more sense for us to release something more often. Could we change that and still release value, right? Not task release through the architecture. Or it, does it make sense to release value uh, more frequently because we we get more feedback that way? But right sizing work is all about on average how much does it normally take for us to release something, and then it's this new thing about the same size. If you release one thing once a week, you only need two things for sprint planning. You don't need to look at anything else. Number two or three. What do we need to do to be valuable agile coaches or consultants? Oh, so you got to show the value to your clients and customers. If you are an agile coach inside the organization, or regardless of whether or not you're a contract or an employee, it's all about What does the business value? Does the business want faster delivery for more money? Most of my clients want faster delivery for more money. That's why I'm I'm talking about that. Do they want to be able to acquire more, more customers? Everything we do is all about the value we offer. I am, I am noodling this, um, this very blog post, how how agile coaches and consultants can show their value. I um, in the successful independent consulting book, I have these three ideas of value: tangible value, which is often about the waste that people will no longer have; the intangible va- value, which is mostly about um, the effects of of the direct value, and the peripheral value, which is how people feel when you're done. And it's not just how the team feels, it's about the ease of management. So if we are effective agile coaches and consultants, our managers should feel more trust with the team. If the managers do not feel more trust, we are not doing enough. Now, there are many, many reasons for that. The last time I was an agile coach for team, my, the, um, the VP who, are in, who hired me after he hired me said, you had these very strict boundaries. Well, I don't think, I don't do boundaries. <laughs> All of you are probably much nicer than I am. I don't do boundaries. That's not why people hire me, right? They hire me for my frank and direct advice. So I said to him, um, I will I will do this on, on only one, I will do this um, after you allow me to speak to, Z- to senior leadership. And I asked senior leadership, um, I gave them more five-point scales, and I said, would you would you like to be able to trust the team? Or are you always sitting on the, do you want to sit on the edge of your seat? And I I mostly gave them binary choices because that, that proved my point, right? But then I showed them the five-point scale afterwards. But when I... When I showed them my value in terms of the overall organization, now they are willing to say, oh, fine, we'll let Joe how to do something here. Yeah, so um, if you are a coach for a team, you're supposed to actually um, increase agility throughout the organization. If you don't have the ability to do that, 
you somehow need to partner with somebody else. And this is where Esther, I always talk about Esther's book in my in my talks. I don't know what's wrong with me. Esther's, Esther's book about um, the change book, is that seven rules for change, six rules for change? Esther Derby, change, right? Um, search on that, buy it, read it, use it. Okay. I don't think she ever does this for me. I should, I should tell her. Oh, in the Agile Registrant as well. Here. Final question. Are there any cases where using cost of delay does not work or where you would not use it? I am actually struggling through that that chapter in the continual planning book. Right now, I always say to start with cost of delay. I offer other alternatives, but for me, they are such less useful alternatives that I am sticking with cost of delay. I know that some people really like weighted shorter job first. I never know what the weighted shorter job first is unless we use right sizing. So, and I I find cost of delay a far superior um, measure in my experience so far. So I'm experimenting with some of my clients. What can I tell you? Okay, Joanna, that's it. Uh, we've come to the end. <laughs> Thank you so much for your generous donation to the community and uh, uh, leading us through your, your exciting talk. Thank you, and thanks all of you. This is, I'm really happy to talk about this stuff, as you can tell. Great. Take care, Joanna. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.